Hello and welcome to this edition of Beacon Hill Report. I'm Jim Marshall and joining me in the studio today is Senator Mark Montigny from the 2nd Bristol and Plymouth District. We thank him for joining us. Uh, full disclosure, two things. One, this show was his idea because back last fall he was the one that said you should be hosting a show to talk about uh, things that are going on in Beacon Hill with the legislatures and the other full disclosure thing is yes I did uh, work with him and his, ran his district office for five years. Felt like 15, it's dog years I know but thanks for That's joining because us. because we overworked <laughs> you and underpaid you. <laughs> I always say I got a master's degree in government working in the office for five years. Thank you for coming on, I appreciate thanks. it. And, and thanks that you served our constituency so well Jim, seriously. I could joke and I could bust your chops a little on this and say that we're still cleaning up your work but the truth is you did a fabulous job and worked really hard and the pay was not that good. This um, and the show from your idea has gone really well. We've had the reps in, they've talked about a lot of stuff and they've really appreciated the um, outlet, I guess, to talk to uh, their constituents. So nice little prop there for you. Uh, I have to ask you right at the start though, um, you were talking to me and like I said, we've known each other for 20, 30 years, it seems pretty much. Um, you were telling me not that long ago, your perception of things has changed as a lawmaker when, although it's probably changed for me too because I was single, you were single, but now as a dad of a five-year-old um, who runs around. <laughs> runs um, me around. Runs you around. Um, I thought it was interesting you said your perspective, being a, you know, obviously your dad, being a legislator, it's changed a lot. Well, like any parent knows and you know, uh, it it literally is like flipping a switch and everything changes um, overnight. Uh, but I think maybe even more so when you're older. So you can't even hide your age anymore in politics because you can just Google it. But uh, to say that I'm a middle-aged dad would be accurate. And it's my, he's my first child and the love of my life. It's like nothing I've ever experienced. I have, um, I almost just wonder how I went so long and missed this. And I think if I had started earlier uh, I wouldn't have I wouldn't stop at one but he's the love of my life do you think about that though like when you're thinking of policy or whatever you're doing as far as like you're thinking well what's what's my kid what am I leaving for you know what I'm saying what am I leaving for my kid sure I think that everything is a little more personal I mean I would like to believe that if you're going to lead and legislate or, or be in any uh, public service role. You have an obligation to be empathetic. You have an obligation to understand particularly the needs of children. But um, as a parent, you learn firsthand the challenges. And, you know, I mean, it, it's made me as a single dad, I mean, let me clarify that. So his mom and I are co-parenting. She's a great mom. And although we're not together romantically, now, by the way, my mom would read this and uh, watch this and say, why did you have to say that? <laughs> In this day and age, you might as well. Um, so but she and I work at it. But ultimately, when I'm with him or when she's with him, we are a, you know, a single parent. There's no one, like, you know, when my mom or dad needed help, we were in the same place at the same mm -hmm. time, often, with both parents, and you just said, oh, you know, my dad's name was Bud. My mom said, Bud, do this. We do it um, separately but together, so it's made me really appreciate. Imagine a single mom working 50 hours a week mm -hmm. and doing it without the help of a, of a co-parent or without the help of a husband or, or, or reverse, a and single dad uh, doing it without the help of a good partner. Um, so it's made me, it's changed my perspective on everything, made me more empathetic, um, uh, but also uh, I understand why parents are so protective. I understand why they care about safety. I understand why they worry about bullying and all those things that are on parents' minds. One of the things uh, to start, I, I guess right now as we, as we tape this program, there's no state budget. 
Uh, obviously, you're not on the negotiating committee, and I know that. You have a unique perspective because you have been a Ways and Means chairman. And I, don't, I know you don't know the particulars, but why would there be a delay? Um, so, good, good question. So, first of all, let me start with the good news. There is absolutely no effect on the Commonwealth's credit, although some would suggest it could be, um, or on the operation of government day to day because of the interim budget. But it should be done on time. It's embarrassing. But let me start, because a lot of people in this district that I represent know who Mike Rodericks is. He's not only my closest friend in the Senate and a tremendous leader for the South Coast, but he's now uh, in that very challenging role. In my lifetime, I, have, I can't cite another professional role that was more interesting, powerful, uh, gratifying, but difficult. I mean, there were, there were weeks where I worked straight seven days, and there were 14, 15-hour days. Um, there were many nights after midnight, and that included things like a 4th of July weekend. So it isn't for lack of work. The budget, much of it is rote, and I, I'm a numbers person. I, I thrive on number crunching, so it was interesting for me. But that's not what it's about. It's about policy and people's lives and taxpayers and beneficiaries of state programs. So after you go through the road exercise of hundreds and hundreds of line items, you then get into the true philosophical conflict between the leaders. Um, no matter how hard you work, for instance, it took us about two to three weeks to finish the budget in terms of every line mm -hmm. item and every outside section. Then the politics, which is more between the Speaker of the House and the Senate President, enter into it. And if there isn't a really good relationship between those two, it can be held up days, weeks, months. I'm not overly concerned, as the Governor has said, although I, I do think it's um, a goal that should be met. I mean, I always felt frustrated if we didn't reach the July 1st deadline. But the key is to make sure that you get the budget right. And I think we could have one next week. Is there one or two things that hold it up? or is it? Yeah, well, one of the things that the, the, the media is very good at figuring that out, by the way. One of the things that's, that's holding it up is one of my longest time um, fights, and that is fighting big pharma in the pharmaceutical industry and price gouging. The Senate has a far better plan. The House caved into the pharmaceutical industry. But let me be very clear. Um, Democrats and Republicans should be called out on the scam that we have with pharmaceutical drug pricing. So I've been the unequivocal leader on it. I won't make a statement like that. Well, and you, not leave you, any room. you are the you and uh, Representative McDonough with that bill way back when. Well, but we created the subsidy for seniors, the Prescription Advantage and, pres and mm -hmm. Senior Prescription Program. And every senior in Massachusetts loved me, particularly in the district. But that is, that's only half of the equation, because taxpayers pay for that. You then have to take on the industry. It's been the loneliest fight that I have had up there, fighting big pharma, because people are gaga over the biotech industry, and leaders in Massachusetts have fallen in bed with their lobbyists and their money and their ribbon cuttings. Um, if there's one thing I will say today that I'm most frustrated about, it's being alone fighting against the pharmaceutical industry and the public needs to be outraged. The only good news is that people are so m angry about it that now you've got all these Johnny-come-lately politicians in both parties, in Boston and in Washington, saying, oh, we have to take on this industry. It's 20 years overdue. So here we are with a minor piece in the Senate, and the House is caving into uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Anyway, even if the Senate prevails, I will say, great work. Now we have 60% more to do. It's, yeah, it's a, it's an endless fight, really, because the battle, the prices are still, you know, still up there. Well, yeah, and special interests run American politics. So until you take money out of politics, much less so in Massachusetts. Like, for instance, I have the biggest war chest in Massachusetts. Proud of it. Almost every dime was raised from New Bedford, Dartmouth, Fairhaven, Acushnet, and Mattapoisett. And I don't take any of that dirty money. So don't tell me it can't be done, because I've got more money in the account than the Senate president and the speaker combined. And it all came here locally. Um, so you can easily say no to lobbyists, you can say no to their dirty money. In Washington, it's insidious. Both parties are accepting hundreds of millions of dollars in dirty money in campaigns. But why do you think 20 years, and again, only because I remember when you were chair of health care, why is it 20 years later it's still not well, in the forefront? Again, let me tell you as someone who's been at the forefront of every single battle, the Boston Globe journalist one time said he's public enemy number one of big pharmaceutical and I thought that's that's a campaign slogan thank you for, for telling me that although he didn't mean it all as a compliment he this was in the business section and they meant it like he's taking on this thriving embryonic biotech industry um, it's one simple thing in Massachusetts 
the biotech industry is such a powerful jobs generator that we confuse this life-saving regulated product with this job creating machine. On the broader level in Washington, there is no other reason other than they have tobacco used to be that good and then tobacco got taken down in the courts. Big Pharma is the best lobbying group in Washington with only a couple of, of, of sort of brothers and sisters, the NRA, the oil industry, the defense industry. There are very few special interests that successful at killing everything that speaks to their status quo or speaks against their status quo. There's no other reason. I've been in every single battle and they have thwarted the few of us who care about price gouging. Every single person who consumes drugs should be pissed off. Is, um, is uh, revenue an issue? And I know because I read in the paper, I know that uh, uh, something that is, <laughs> and I use this facetiously, near and dear to your heart, they're talking about a, ta a, a, gas on, a tax on gas and what have you which you know a legislator or never mind a legislator but a person who's trying to go to work in mm -hmm. Boston would be hosed compared yeah. to somebody who lives there I mean is, is, is revenue an issue for the budget? So I mean, it depends who you ask I, I think revenues are flowing fine um, if a gas tax came up tomorrow I'd vote against it proudly I did the last time it came up if a if a um, uh, the, you know the sales tax increase I voted against and you think like well gee aren't you a pretty proud progressive yes but I've also seen the state budget I've seen the waste and I see the millions and mi hundreds of millions of dollars in tax credits that are going to the biotech industry the film industry all this other corporate welfare and what I've said very simply to uh, other leaders in the legislature I've said if you want to have a serious discussion about revenue the first thing you have to do is show me how we close corporate loopholes mm -hmm. and corporate welfare but you also on sp specifically on gas tax um, I won't even consider it until commuter rail is already here now as you know Jim because you were in my office um, I many people have had their hands in pushing commuter rail forward there's certainly no one who has done more sp than I have in terms and you know again I wouldn't say that it's rather pretentious to say it on cable TV um, unless I could prove it so most of the bonding the design bill legislation, the south of Cotley Junction legislation, the bridge work um, was done by me and my and, and my staff. And a lot of it was conferenceable. I wasn't even in the House. Um, more recently, we've had good support from this governor, thankfully. But until and unless there is actually a train in New Bedford, and I'm becoming more optimistic. I was going to say, do you think I got it's over the happen? cheerleading many years ago because I got tired of my constituents asking, "Where is it?" Yeah. Um, I do think. We have more than a fighting chance, although I'm concerned with how the tea seems to be falling apart in Boston. But I do believe that uh, for the first time, I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, but again, how can you even discuss with someone? I commuted last night from Boston. It took me two and a half hours. You want to talk to me about a gas tax? I, I, I never say never. But if you ask me right now, a gas tax comes before me, would I vote for it? No. The, um, with the budget, I know it's not finalized, but you have stuff in there that uh, obviously are important to you, um, earmarks, legislative. Is there any one or two things that you're most proud of as far as uh, that, I don't want to say it was a fight, but something that uh, you're really happy that you got? Well, you know, so I'm always at pushing policy. I'm always trying to take on bad nursing home operators, um, um, pharmaceutical pricing, uh, et cetera. But the thing I get most excited by, because I'm a New Bedford, person. I'm a New Bedford, former New Bedford kid. I ran around these streets, so I tend to be uh, very supportive and even empathetic when need be for um, kids that are growing up in the city and maybe not getting enough access to art and culture and recreation. So many years ago, as you know, I wrote the legislation to build the staff store. Probably still my most proud singular capital project, F not just because the staff store was cool and brought the university downtown and the thousands of BCC students, but because it's the impetus that transformed New Bedford. I get to say if I retire tomorrow or the voters get sick of me and retire me, um, that many people made New Bedford into this arts and cultural mecca, no one more so uh, than me in this, adoration, in this iteration. For this reason, I listened to Whale, who had done the last iteration. I listened to store owners and small business people. I listened to artists and musicians who had never left. New Bedford was always an arts and cultural district, but it needed polishing. And we came up with this vision that if we build Star Store, they will come. Now, it didn't just come with Star Store. I've individually earmarked between the Star Store, the transformation of Route 18, uh, the saving of the Zyterian Theater years ago, 
and then m the more positive thing, the last 10 years, just s continuously seeding the arts and cultural institutions so we have a critical mass. No one, even our worst critic, could say that we haven't transformed the downtown. And that wouldn't have happened without Star Store. Now, okay, so why am I talking about something I did years ago, besides that I'm proud of it? Well, Route 18, too, that, uh, that's that was been going on for a long time. Yeah, I earmarked that around the same time, yeah. and the city was slow in doing it, but it came But it was along. a city-state thing, too, they right. because that's a But the city had to do weird the highway, actual work. You know. We earmarked the right. money. Um, but here's the thing that people don't realize. I, I only say that history because people don't realize that if you don't continuously support through mass cultural and through my own earmarks, the downtown arts and cultural scene and the north and south end, the sort of budding projects that are going on there, um, there's a chance that it dies out. You, 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 in other words, it's more reliant now on p uh, private sector investment. And that's, that was my vision and my goal along with Tony Souza and so many others, that if you build it and you put in the infrastructure, the private sector will pick up. Because if not, the project is a failure. So I'm earmarking hundreds of thousands of dollars in every budget, including this one, to give New Bedford children access to that now. Because ironically, my work on Star Store and on these, you know, the Zyterian and AHA and um, the different museums, in some ways, critics, not, and I mean friendly critics, have said you, you can actually gentrify and even though that seems like a foreign word for New Bedford because we're still in a process of, of growth and still have a lot of work to do, if you can't afford it and you're from a New Bedford middle class or working class family, then we have failed. So I earmark all of my money now for local organizations that give access to children, New Bedford children and the surrounding towns for arts, culture, and recreation. Everything from giving the Boys and Girls Club a van so they can get to recreational things to youth opportunities unlimited, buying the boys and girls new bikes, computers at um, uh, North Star Learning, the ball field for uh, in memory of um, uh, AJ um, who died of cancer. So it's hard not to get excited about that. So that's all riding in the budget. I Are feel you confident? I, well, yes. I mean, I never count the dollars or the votes until we complete things, but I have a great relationship with the Ways and Means Chair and each senator gets a, you know, and I'm a senior person, so I know how to really figure this out, and that's why I've been able to help Youth Court and a bunch of dif different organizations, um, but I'm most proud of this, like, you think about it, there's no organization pouring in a half a million every year to give access to New Bedford children to arts, culture, and recreation. So, and that's what I'm doing. Every year, we're giving out these grants. It's the Montigny Children's Fund, and we've helped thousands of kids already. I'm excited about that. What, a, uh, as you talk about downtown, um, talk a little bit about uh, the harbor and the, the things that the state are doing. I know that it um, wasn't that long ago that uh, there was legislation that changed who runs the harbor. Um, but talk a little bit about some of the things that the, the state's doing that you see coming down the road for that, which so certainly is an asset that a lot of cities don't have. So this, of if you just asked me what I'm most excited about um, happening in the New Bedford economy now. Now, obviously, commuter rail has been this long-term thing that with it comes tremendous economic opportunity and some challenges that, that we won't get into today on housing and other, other issues. But there's nothing that gets me as excited about downtown than the work we're doing on State Pier. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, the, you know, there's always an argument about the sum of the parts. Well, I've always felt that if you could take the downtown, and it took years, I mean, literally every single budget and every single capital bond, I earmarked money for downtown New Bedford. And some would even say, well, you know, you could have spent more elsewhere, but if you do not have the core of your city and you don't have an image changer and you don't have something transformative like the downtown, you suffer in other areas of the city. So yes, it's still important and that's why Route 18 is being continued down to the south end. It's why we're doing the international marketplace and some neat projects with whale in the north end. But if you don't have that attraction where cruise ships now come in, where the Charles W. Morgan came in, where the fast ferry service that we built in the legislature. We earmarked the money and, you know, I passed the legislation. So if you don't have those people coming in to get to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, you don't have the chance to broadly change your economic uh, um, um, status. Now, of course, 
there's nothing more important than the industrial park and the overall manufacturing economy, the fishing industry, um, but you also need tourism, you need arts and culture, you do, if you want to polish your image. So what I've tried to do is spend, and, and, and I've earmarked $25 million for this project, we need to enhance the fishing industry. That means they need dredging, fendering, piers, um, the cargo industry needs the state pier fixed, it was literally falling mm -hmm. into the water. But I earmarked the money with a contingency and said, we've got to look towards you know, this next decade and next century, and it can't just be commercial interests, although those have to be protected. They cannot be displaced. And what I'm doing is, is with this money, it's earmarked to make it a mixed-use pier. Um, I did this probably 10 years ago, and more recently the mayor and the city council have also uh, been very supportive. Uh, and the language is clear. It's, it basically is, is, is sort of a visionary language. It comes with a $25 million bond, and it says, basically, we're going to tie in downtown New Bedford, which the last five, six, seven, eight years have been the easy part. I'm not saying you can't continue to do things. That's why we've done the sidewalk work. That's why we've done Route 18. But most of the hard work was done. 10, 15 years ago in downtown. Now it's all private investment, it's doing streetscapes, it's holding festivals, it's welcoming sculpture, uh, sculptures, it's welcoming you know, super flat murals, it's sort of like all mm -hmm. good news. Buildings are being sold, they're being fixed. Hundreds and hundreds of people are living upstairs that when I did the Star Store, they, they were all empty, the second and third floors. Nobody wanted to live there by choice. Now they're fighting to live in this beautiful place. The pier, they enhance each other. So the tourists that come through downtown. And the economic impact that the, the economic provides. impact is huge already. Th the whole waterfront, because of the fishing industry, is enormous. And that's why it needs dredging and fendering, and you have to protect that interest. But the cargo business, the potential for, for mid sized cruise ships, all of that is huge and relying on the state pier. Because the state pier is really the only major area that you can develop. So my $25 million bond, which is law, this isn't a pipe dream, politicians are great with I file the bill, I file more bills in the world, and I'm, it's a pipe dream. This is money that's bonded. In the language, my language that's passed several times, says that it shall be for mixed use. So it's not going to just be this closed, fenced off area anymore. You know, you see that with the, with the Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard Ferry, but you're gonna see a much more enhanced, publicly usable state pier. You have restaurants down there, you have a hotel. This vision of using public money for infrastructure and programming, which we had 15 years ago, is now paying off because multi, multi, multi million dollar investment in the private sector is now picking up the slack. And so what'll, what'll the difference between with State Pier and then the Marine Commerce Terminal that the state has? Just so that people know what Sure. What's going on between the two? Because so, it's different. So ultimately, the Marine Commerce Terminal, which the state also paid for. I mean, people don't realize that the federal government walked away from all community and economic development years ago. I mean, they still do block grant type, you know, type things mm -hmm. and formulaic things. And every once in a while, you know, we had great uh, grant, uh, multi-million dollar grant for dredging and harbor work. But m almost all of the economic development of New Bedford what I'll call the political economic development as opposed to private sector investment has come through the state legislature. And that's been my, my forte along with uh, working with the House of Representatives. And the, so the, the commerce terminal we see as wind energy. The state pier is a mixed use, everything from ferry terminals to cargo to cruise ships to, you know, visits like the Charles W. Morgan, access for the public to come and enjoy public concerts and public venues. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting. When you think of the sum of those parts, look at the whole. Look at what we have to look forward to. And we already have, I mean, I, I've, you know, the one benefit I've had, always loved New Bedford. My, my grandfather was a whaling artist. But I think I really begun to appreciate it when I ventured out into the world. So I've been seen as much of the world as any American I've ever met, um, a multitude of countries and continents, and I live a half a mile from where I grew up, and I cannot believe how fortunate we are to live in New Bedford. I, and I'm not saying we don't have things we don't like, and we don't have you know, scars and warts and places to fix. We have typical American problems that need fixing, but we have this very, very unique, beautiful community. Um, that to me is something to look forward to. I leave Boston, I can't wait to leave. 
I go through a horrendous commute and I arrive in my little city and I'm happy. Let me ask you, we only got a couple minutes left, but I'm curious as to, you've been in the Senate, as you said, uh, for 27 years, but I'm curious as to how, has, have things changed for you to get things done? Uh, is it, and I guess this is more of a philosophical, political question, is it, is it difficult? I mean, I can remember as, you know, as we were talking off air, it seemed, certainly when I was up there, you had a good relationship with uh, Republicans, and, and I'm not, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying you don't now, but yeah, I know that you had, you had a good relationship with Paul Salucci, which yeah. people may not know about. Um, the Senate uh, Minority Leader, you had a good relationship with him. Just the atmosphere. Is it different um, politically for you to get things that you want done sure. from... So I guess that's, a, that's, a, that's a great I guess compromise is, is you know, we hear question. compromise is yeah. a, a difficult question, but I don't, does it still go on? Sure. So first of all, it's, it still does go on more in Boston than Washington. Um, I have a great relationship with most of my Republican colleagues. Obviously, I have a lot of friendships on the Democratic side. Um, at the end of the day, it's tougher, though. The world is much more um, polarized. So people like me, and I am unapologetic about being a progressive. But what confuses liberals is I'm fiscally conservative in the way of not liking waste. And that used to sound like hypocrisy, except when I explained to them that I chaired a budget and that if you're wasting a billion dollars on corporate welfare, don't talk to me about raising the gas tax that hurts working people. Talk to me about going after the corporations. And then, then a lot of the, my, my liberal friends will say, Okay, fair, fair argument. But so much is black and white now. Like you're either passing this certain litmus test and you know throwing bombs from one side of the aisle or the other. That's just not my style. I'm, I'm again, I'm not apologetic. I am progressive on every social issue. I was probably the first person in the legislature to support same-sex marriage. But when it comes to spending taxpayer money, I, I feel the same pain although I may have it a little easier than many of my constituents. I understand what they go through because I'm here and I listen to them. And I do think it's more difficult in the social media world where people aren't studying the issues as much. They get like a little, you know, meme and all of a sudden it's like, oh, he's a bad guy. Like I've heard, I've had nasty, nasty things said and written about me. And sometimes they're accurate. I deserve, I deserve some good criticism. Um, but a lot of times they're not. And, w and if I had a chance to explain people for the most Pot will apologize or back off, and and really rude idiots. I don't. I could care less. I'm, I, I mean, mean, I'm a I'm a street fighter from New Bedford who just happens to be a little bit older now. So I don't take any crap from people who who have no argument other than a disparaging personal comment. And I get it. I, I hear it. I mean, if I were younger, I'd. But take compromise them on. is a good <laughs> word though for you but, too. Uh, well, compromise is a great word, and I still believe, particularly in Boston, that we compromise. I compromise with the minority leader Bruce Tower all the time. He and I have led the issue on protecting animals against animal abuse. I have a cat declaring bill uh, Monday. I had Nero's Law yesterday on, on uh, because of Sergeant Gannon's tragic death and the sh shooting of his canine. So we work, Bruce Tower and I work together c constantly on animal issues, but also on, on other issues, holding the T the pension plan accountable from being the inept organization they are. So compromise is absolutely still available, but I think the political climate is much tougher. I'm going to have to leave it at that. It's good seeing you. Good to see you. Thank buddy. you for coming it's in. Always good. Um, we miss you. We will be um, doing this again in six months. I look forward It'll be to your it. Turn. It goes by. I, have, I had 50 other things, and you probably had 100. But it was good stuff. That's going to do it for this edition. We will be back next month with this edition of the Bilkin Hill Report. Thanks for watching. Thank you.